Dear friends and uh, colleagues, a little bit late, but finally we are ready to start the launch of EI's Global Year of Action, Unite for Education, Better Quality Education for a Better World. To start that launch, we are going to have um, two welcome addresses. The first will be on behalf of the Director General of the UNESCO, who unfortunately cannot be here in person right at this moment. But uh, Mr. Tang, Assistant Director General for Education, will deliver the opening address on behalf of Ms. Bokova. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I apologize for our Director General, uh, Madame Bukova. Uh, she very much wished to be here, but then you probably know uh, we're going to have an election tonight. So you can see uh, how busy she, she is. So she just called me uh, five minutes ago. She said she not, cannot make it. She asked me to come here. To, make, uh, to, speak, to say a few words, to welcome everybody on her behalf. So I, I see I would like to say UNESCO fully support the launch of the new initiative by the Education International. It's a better education for a better world. And this is, is fully in line with UNESCO's priority areas and also in line with the direction of education for all. Education, for us, I'm sure you all agree, is a basic human right for everybody. It's a public good for everybody. It should have a equity, quality, and also from a lifelong learning prospect. So I will have to say this is also in line with our thinking of the post-2015 global education agenda. For the new agenda, we say there has to be a universal agenda relevant to everybody. We're talking about the quality, equity, and the lifelong learning and education for all. This is why we really support this initiative launched by Education International. And of course, when we're talking about the quality of education, teacher is one of the key factors. And uh, without good teachers, no way we cannot talk about quality of education. When I visit many, many developing countries, when I ask their ministers of education, what are they, their most important challenges, our needs? And almost everybody said, I need more teachers, I need better teachers, which means you have to train more teachers, you have to provide retraining for teachers. In this regard, we are very proud that we, are, we have been working very closely with Education International in the last few years. Well, actually, I should be for the last few decades, probably. But actually, the last couple of years, uh, with Fred and our, our team here, we really worked together to promote the same goal, which is promoting the teacher training, and also, of course, we're talking about policy, we're talking about their working conditions, and talking about their salary, and talking about the status. Of course, we also would like to talk about, when we talk about the teachers, we think about the teachers not only teach young generations about how to read and write, we talk about how to teach them on value, on peace, uh, intercultural understanding so they can be a global citizens when they grow up. This is a huge task also for teachers and also for the teacher development program. So in this regard, actually, we are fully committed to support this kind of work together with Education International. And also, as I said this morning, Education International is one of our strongest collaborators in promoting education for all, and also promoting the global education agenda. So in the end, 
allow me, on behalf of Director General Madame Bukova again, and on behalf of UNESCO, to congratulate Education International for launching this initiative. And UNESCO will be really working close with you, and I wish you a great success after you have a long-lasting impact for the teacher development and for teacher and also for education for all at the global level. So thank you so much, Fred. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Tang, and I hope you will bring our greetings to Ms. Bokova from all of us and then thank her for her support for our campaign. And then, swiftly, I give the floor to our General Secretary of Education International, Fred van Leuven. Thank you very much, Mr. Assistant Director General. Um, dear friends, dear colleagues, today, across the world, Education International is launching its Unite for Quality Education campaign. Today, you could say we are renewing our commitment to quality education and turning it into a broader movement, mobilizing 30 million teachers and education professionals and uniting with parents, with students, with communities, with governments, with NGOs, with international organizations and others which share our vision. Unite to demand that quality education for every student is made a reality. We saw evidence of that movement and its cross-community support on display on July 12th at the United Nations Malala Day. Some young teachers participated in this July event and a young Egyptian teacher spoke saying her union fights for the rights to education, especially for girls, and she urged the United Nations to create laws that make going to school an obligation for all children. We also saw evidence of that same movement here in Europe, where teachers' organizations actively and vigorously resist short-sighted and ill-conceived austerity measures, closing of schools in Greece, teachers' layoffs in Spain, and throwing teachers into poverty in Portugal, to, to name some notable examples. We saw similar evidence of that movement in, in America, where quality teaching and quality learning are threatened by waves of standardized testing and high stakes teachers evaluation, where feds and fashion seem to have more influence than generations of human experience. Again, we saw similar evidence in South America, where, for example, in Brazil, a popular movement led by teachers demand priority for education. In Asia and in Africa, where member organizations of Education International have very recently pledged to mobilize their classroom teachers and to further increase the pressure on their governments. Yes, across the world, this, this call for access, this call for quality is changing the dialogue about our future. But to change the re reality for millions of students, we must have impact on the way that education is seen and valued. 
In this Unite for Quality Education campaign, we will try to bring together the voices of those of us who know that quality education is a key to a better world. Our aim is to create awareness among governments, among intergovernmental agencies and society in general, that quality education for all is a, is a central part of any viable national or global development strategy. We plan to highlight successful educational practices and activities and will seek support for making them available to all teachers, to all schools, and to all education authorities. We will emphasize the vital role of professional teachers and the need to support them with modern teaching and learning tools and to support them with quality learning environments. Now, the context for our UNITE campaign is quite challenging. Governments have, in our view, paid too little attention to education as a human right. Despite a significant improvement in primary school enrollment, progress has slowed down and inequalities remain quite high. Those who tend to remain excluded are the poor, are girls, are disabled children, are children in rural areas, are children in conflict areas, are children in what they call post-conflict situations, are children of migrants, among many others. Tuition fees and the indirect costs of education still form the single biggest barrier to equitable access to quality education. To those who believe that low fee for profit education is the answer to get the final 10% into school, we say, please do not force poor people to choose whether they have to feed their children, to give them education, or to send them to school. That is immoral. So, a renewed commitment to free quality education for all is very urgently needed. Education is a public good. It is a basic right, and therefore, education must be publicly financed. No child should be, should be priced out of education. At the World Congress of Education International in Cape Town two years ago, we have set principles and parameters for the high quality and equitable education systems we believe our societies deserve. Quality education, let us not forget this, is based on three pillars. One, quality teaching. Two, quality tools. And three, quality environments. At all levels of education and in all communities. Quality teaching, we will achieve that when all students are being taught by teachers with comprehensive teacher education supported by continuous professional development. Quality tools, quality tools to aid teaching and learning should be available in particular through the application of ICT, that is by harnessing 
the enormous power of the internet and modern technology to assist and support teaching and learning, not to replace teachers, not to substitute for the unique relationship between teacher and learner, but to assist the teacher and to assist the learner. Finally, quality learning environments are to be safe and supportive with the appropriate facilities to encourage student learning and to enable teachers to teach effectively. I've said this morning, and I repeat this afternoon, no organizations have fought as hard for the resources and tools and proper environments for teaching and learning and to, and to professionalize the teaching core. No organizations have fought fought as hard for that as those representing uh, uh, teachers. I want to make it very clear to all of you that we are engaging in this campaign with our eyes wide open. We know there are elements of the public and private sectors that would prefer teachers not to engage in education policy or in the political process by which policy is set, we will confront them. And some of these same elements are interested in nothing less than eliminating public education and mining these public resources for private profit. We will confront them as well. Some view education as a market, with teachers as, as removable and repa replaceable inputs, we will confront them. Yes, we will seek to unite, but teachers and families and students and communities who care about quality education and the future will never shrink from a fight. We will take advantage of every opportunity to state the facts about the critical importance of teachers in education and of public education as a public good and a right for every student, a right that cannot be sacrificed by the poor and middle class, especially as education financing is squeezed in the name of economic recovery plans. Education is, is more than a human right. Because when that right to education is fully realized, it is also a way to build better, freer, and more democratic societies and to equip students not only with skills for work, but with aptitude for life. Quality education helps students build enough personal strength to gain respect. It enables human dignity. Ours is a profession that is moving forward with a unified goal to give every student the, the ability as Mr. Ban Ki-moon has said, to forge more just, peaceful, and tolerant societies. Our goal, quality education for everybody, is an ambitious one. We remember what Nelson Mandela said so eloquently, namely that education, yes, is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Now, we believe that we have a great chance to meet our goal. And in the coming year, we have an even greater opportunity to go beyond ambitious, to be, to be bold, to challenge ourselves outside the bounds of traditional alliances, and to recognize that working together, we have the power to, yes, make a world of difference. Thank you.
Thank you, Fred. You know, I'm rather proud standing here representing Education International and our 30 million members. Also, I am rather proud of being a teacher. I hope there are other proud teachers in the room because it is an important and a demanding profession in which you need knowledge, skills, experience in order to reach out to each child in the best possible way. But you know, the pure joy of taking part in a child's learning experience is so heartwarming and rewarding. It is equally depressing to know that all children don't have a teacher to push, to pull, and to support them along the educational path. So, dear friends, we unite for quality education, also for those children. In 2011, 57 million children of primary school age were out of school. In 2012, 73 million children between the age of 5 and 11 were child laborers. These numbers are in many ways depressing and they tell us that we still have serious work to do. But believe it or not, they are also symbols of progress because both these numbers, the 57 and the 73, are lower than they were 10 years ago. More children are in school and fewer children have to work. In reviewing the Millennium Development Goals and setting the post-2015 agenda, global leaders are doing something we understand well as educators. Because they are marking our progress and renewing our commitment to take on our challenges. We must make sure there is a renewed commitment to education, a commitment to quality education, and a commitment to involve teachers and their organizations in achieving this. I have been fortunate enough to meet teachers and visit schools in many countries and in all continents of the world. And in some way, I have always felt connected to whoever teacher I have met. I've always had a feeling of sense of being at home whichever school I have entered. There is so much more that unites us than divides us. Teaching is a global profession and there certainly is a passion for quality education among the teachers of the world. We do see the progress being made in providing access to education. But all the same, we know that access isn't enough. We must provide quality education to every single student. So let me repeat, like Fred said, because the EI members share a common belief that quality education is based on three pillars. Quality teaching, quality teaching and learning tools, and quality teaching and learning environments at all levels of education and in all communities. Teachers, whether in Paris or New York, are in many respects the same as teachers in Brazil, Tunisia or Malaysia. They are working to lead our professions and taking responsibility for our own professional practice. We believe that each one of us, as an educator, plays a critical role in student success. Let me also quote Paulo Freire, 
who has inspired so much of our Latin American pedagogical movement. And I quote, the teacher is of course an artist, but being an artist does not mean that he or she can make the profile, can shape the students. What the educator does in teaching is to make it possible for the students to become themselves. The special challenge that we are taking on through the UNITE campaign is to raise the voices and experiences of teachers and support professionals around the world to bring their success, their hopes and their challenges to a global audience. So, to do that, a special website, uniteforeducation.org, will act as the hub of a year-long campaign. This hub will bring together educator voices that are raised to make sure that quality access to education for every student becomes a focus of international development. The campaign will work to capture international attention for the human beings behind the profession, as well as the role of teachers in the community while paying attention to the consequences of current work environments, policies, and reforms. Real life on the ground stories. To do so, the hub will feature a community section where activists can come together to share experience and expertise. This information will also feed into a map which will show what our affiliates are doing around the world alongside other important events all through the campaign year. But dear friends, this depends on you telling us what's going on so we can activate the map. And this will enable everybody to take part in actions in their own area. In addition, as part of that effort, Education International is producing a documentary a day in the life of a teacher, bringing stories and images from the lives of teachers around the world. The video sees through an educator's eyes issues including class sizes, teacher training, school curricula, education in rural areas, and information and communication technology in education. Let's have a look at some of that video. <laughs> Às vezes tem que ir a preparar uma pessoa para pegar trabalho na cidade. Seria interessante também colocar nesse currículo, nessa pedagogia educacional, fatos de trabalho na zona rural, no mundo da zona rural também. Porque é o mundo deles. Aqui como corpo humano, né, onde está mais doente e que precisa ser mais bem tratado, né? Eu acredito, com certeza, que a escola né, que tem mais carência tem que investir mais, né? Tem que ser trabalhado mais, né? little technical problem. You got a first little taste of that video, but it started in the middle instead of starting where it was supposed to start. Modern technology. We'll try again. in balance to have a good quality of education if the teacher themselves must be must be good 
c'est une école de rêve, c'est une école de qualité. Je pense qu'il y a des défis à relever pour avoir une école de qualité. Si l'État cautionne et supporte, améliore l'éducation, c'est des vies aussi qui sont améliorées, c'est la société aussi qui est protégée. L'éducation, c'est un droit humain, c'est un droit social. Si on, on, on apporte une solution aux, aux défis infrastructurels, une solution aux défis structurels, une solution aux défis personnels, quoi de mieux On aurait l'idéal, presque l'idéal. सोचूंगी हमारे हम अगर अपने सपनों का स्कूल सोचें तो हम सोचेंगे हमारे स्कूल में हर फैसिलिटी होनी चाहिए हमारे बच्चे को हर सुविधा मिले जिससे यहाँ पर गरीब बच्चे पढ़ने के लिए आते हैं लेकिन उन्हें जो है उनके अकॉर्डिंग उन्हें सुविधाएं नहीं मिल पाती हैं वी आर द पीपल हु हैव टू डिलीवर वी फील क्वालिटी हैज बिन डायल्यूटेड इन द रेस टू इंक्लूड एवरीबडी इन द फील्ड ऑफ एजुकेशन देर आर हंड्रेड किड्स इन माई स्कूल गुड But how many of the hundred kids are actually getting education should also be the parameter. Boa parte dos nossos alunos eles eles residem na no campo, na zona rural e eles têm uma certa dificuldade de transporte, né? Nosso trabalho, né? Muitas vezes tende a preparar uma pessoa para o mercado de trabalho na cidade. Seria interessante também colocar nesse currículo, nessa pedagogia educacional fatos de trabalho na zona rural, no mundo da zona rural também, porque é o mundo deles. Aqui como corpo humano, né, onde está mais doente e precisa ser mais bem tratado, né? Eu acredito, com certeza, que a escola né, que tem mais carência tem que investir mais, né? Tem que ser trabalhado mais, né? By seeing the world through a teacher's eyes, our own role as teacher leaders in international organizations comes into clearer focus. Equity and justice do not come easy. We know that we must fight for our profession as well as lead it. More than a half century ago, a lawyer named Thurgood Marshall argued a case before the US Supreme Court that ultimately dismantled legal school segregation in the US. He closed his presentation to the court by saying, and I quote, there is no way you can repay lost school years. No one knows that better than a teacher. Together with our partners around the world, we will not let these years be lost access to a quality education will no longer be a right denied to any student. That was a silence to think through that commitment. That is the commitment we are taking on for the coming year. This website we have shown you some pieces of can be a very good tool, but it is dependent on interaction. It is dependent on us sharing what we do so that we can show it to each other and learn from each other. But we will also be initiating more work from Education International itself, and we started more work than just a website. You saw some of the video. But something else that we are, have started working on is developing the teacher's report card for education for all. So I would like to invite two of our chief regional coordinators to come up to the podium. We have Asibi Napoe and Sashi Balasing, our regional chief regional coordinators for Africa, that is Asibi, and for Asia Pacific, is Sashi, and while those two um, clever women come up to the podium, 
uh, just say that I know both uh, Asibi and Sashi as women and teachers who are very concerned with educational quality. They have been very concerned with addressing the use of unqualified teachers, whether called contract teachers, power teachers, or whatever name. And they are both also very keen on promoting the interests of women teachers and girls and making sure that we take care of minority rights. They're going to share the presentation between them and I believe that Asibi will start by outlining what kind of assessment process we have started on and then Sashi will give you a taste of the results from the mapping exercises which have been done in Accra in Africa or for Africa and in Delhi for the Asia Pacific. So Sashi and Asibi and I think Asibi first. Merci, Madame la Secrétaire générale adjointe de l'International de l'Éducation. Vous venez de me présenter comme une enseignante et un enseignante professionnelle de l'éducation. Je vais commencer mon intervention avec un petit exercice ludique. Nous attendons une petite image, toujours la technologie qui va nous poser des problèmes. Vous voyez ce nombre Qu'est-ce que ce nombre vous dit Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui imagine ce que ça signifie De l'Afrique. Si je parle de l'Afrique vers Paris, à l'UNESCO où nous sommes ici, ce nombre, justement, je ne sais pas si ça se voit bien, vous voyez c'est une école, une seule classe de l'Ouganda avec un seul enseignant. Entre ces élèves que vous voyez là et Paris UNESCO, il y a 6150 km. 6150 km. C'est vrai, ce n'est pas un nombre qui provient du, de l'UNESCO, mais c'est un nombre qui nous donne la réalité. Le secrétaire général ce matin, son adjointe tout à l'heure, ont tous dit que nous lançons une campagne pour une année, une meilleure éducation pour un monde meilleur. Au cours de cette année, nous voulons rapprocher ces deux réalités. La réalité sur le terrain en Afrique, la réalité sur le terrain en Asie et la réalité à l'UNESCO. Mais comment cela sera-t-il possible Nous n'avons pas l'intention de déplacer les montagnes. Mais nous voulons ramener au centre des débats, des discussions qui ont lieu au niveau international, tout comme au niveau national, les débats sur la réalisation de l'éducation pour tous et les scénarios possibles de l'après 2015. Nous voulons ramener cette réalité à laquelle les enfants que vous venez de voir et leurs enseignants sont confrontés chaque jour. Pour cela, nous allons donner la parole à nos 30 millions de membres, des éducateurs, des professionnels de l'éducation répartis dans plus de 170 pays du monde 
à travers 400 organisations, afin que ces débats reflètent leur expertise. L'expertise de premier plan, acquise au terme de nombreuses années d'expérience directe de la mise en œuvre de l'éducation pour tous dans l'école et dans les salles de classe. Mais comment allons-nous procéder La secrétaire générale adjointe a déjà parlé d'une carte. Nous voulons une carte scolaire de l'international de l'éducation. Nous avons déjà commencé par mobiliser nos membres à travers des forats de discussion régionale en Afrique. Elle a eu lieu à Accra, au Ghana, en avril dernier, en Asie. Et dans les autres régions, pour les mois à venir, ces forats nous permettront d'engager un large processus de consultation qui seront poursuivis par nos affiliés au niveau national afin de recueillir de façon systématique l'expérience et l'analyse des enseignants et de leurs collègues dans les écoles concernant les réussites et aussi les échecs de l'éducation pour tous. À l'issue de ce processus, les données collectées seront rassemblées dans un rapport mondial de l'éducation pour tous par les enseignants et sera remis aux partenaires au niveau international et à nos gouvernements au niveau national. Mais ne confondons pas le rapport mondial de Rose ce matin et le rapport de l'international de l'éducation. Donc, nous allons mesurer les progrès réalisés pour chacun des six objectifs de l'éducation pour tous. Nous allons bien sûr inclure ces objectifs, mais aller plus loin dans notre analyse et passer en revue les engagements que les gouvernements ont pris à Dakar concernant les douze stratégies à mettre en œuvre pour réaliser le PT. Nous allons aussi inclure les partenaires financiers pour l'engagement pris à Dakar. Pour cela, nous avons identifié quatre piliers qui vont se structurer qui vont structurer notre évaluation. Nous aurons l'engagement politique et les ressources financières. C'est vrai, pas d'éducation de qualité sans des ressources appropriées et suffisantes. Il y a le dialogue et la participation. Un peu partout, les syndicats d'enseignants sont exclus du dialogue sociale et de la concertation. Nous avons les politiques et les législations en faveur de l'EPT. Nous avons un enseignement et un apprentissage de qualité. Pour chacun de ces axes, en bon enseignant, nous allons attribuer une note au gouvernement. Cette note reflétera leur niveau d'engagement et s'ils ont effectivement tenu leur promesse d'offrir à chaque enfant une éducation publique de qualité, ainsi chaque gouvernement obtiendra formellement son relevé de notes, comme dans un lycée ou dans, une, dans un établissement scolaire. Bien sûr, nous n'allons pas nous arrêter là, comme nous le ferions pour un élève qui n'a pas obtenu un score suffisant à l'examen, nous allons formuler les recommandations concrètes et constructives afin que chacun puisse tirer les leçons de ses propres échecs 
et améliorer sa performance dans le futur. Je vais donc laisser la parole à ma collègue Sachi pour qu'elle nous donne le résultat des deux forats organisés en Afrique et en Asie. Merci. Uh, thank you, SCB. Uh, friends and colleagues, as Sister SCB has already mentioned, that we are at the early stages of FI assessment process, and so far, we have listened from our colleagues in Africa and in Asia-Pacific region. Through those listenings, we could able to gather a wealth of information, and I'm very much interested to share a few of those information with you, because these information are not merely the findings, but they are the solid classroom realities with no artificial flavor attached there. I was feeling so amazed when this morning I was listening to the high-level dignities from EI and UNESCO and was wondering whether the feedback on FI assessment from Africa and the Asia-Pacific I'm going to provide or share with you, or I'm just going to echo the same concerns and issues that have already been raised this morning and this afternoon. As Sister SCB has already mentioned, those four pillars that are very important to achieve quality education for all, I'm just going to be very, very brief in providing you a few highlights. Uh, let me start with the commitment and resources. It is very ironical that m many governments have genuinely good in speeches and words rather than action when it comes to the commitment on education. Many countries failed to increase their education budget and the percentage of GDP invested on education sector is either the same as it was in year 2000 or in some instances it has even lowered down. The implementation of national budget on education lack transparency and accountability. The foreign aid has not yielded desirable results due to conditions imposed and by and large, those conditions and policies of these foreign aid do not reflect the national priorities. Many governments try to abolish a school fee, but the hidden cost and lack of proper and advocate teaching and learning environment are remain the serious issues in both Africa and the Asia-Pacific region as per the report received from the colleagues. In the year 2000, the national governments recognized the importance of engagement of civil society in achieving education for all. Where the teachers were given proper opportunities in educational developments, they have contributed meaningfully. However, these opportunities were very, very rare. It is again a big irony that the teachers are considered as implementers of the policies and programs on education, but at the same time, they are the one who are not made aware of these policies and programs, neither they are sufficiently trained as how to implement these policies, program, including curriculum. The third very important area is policy and legislation on education. Let me start with early childhood education. The state funding on early childhood education is very, very low in both the regions. ECE is not integrated in the mainstream education and school system, and therefore it is normally offered by the private schools, and obviously poor children and poor family have no access to early childhood education. 
Talking about primary education, yes, we did have noticed some good and tangible results in terms of new strategies, legislations, and good policies to achieve education for all. However, when it comes to the implementation of these strategies, there are enormous challenges, especially the poor finance and a very, very weak political will. Both are lacking when it comes to the question of implementation of these policies and legislation. Teachers also note some positive development was achieving gender equality in both primary and secondary education. Many governments undertook some special initiatives and the schemes to promote girls' education by way of giving them scholarships, by way of providing transportation facilities and some other measures, particularly like making girls' education free right from primary until tertiary levels. However, there is a serious question of absence of some basic sanitation facilities like separate toilets for girls are still lacking in both the regions and then a very very big and serious issue is the safety and security of both girls and the women teachers shortage of women teachers particularly trained women teachers especially in rural area is another stark reality that is a big hindrance in achieving gender equality in education. Much have been talked already uh, today on shortage of teachers and unqualified teachers. So that is the last point I wish to share with you. That improvement have been noticed in some countries with regards to the teachers' training. At the same time, closure of the training, teachers' training colleges, appointment of contract teachers, Professionally untrained teachers and shortage of teachers are a big and serious concern in both the regions. Teachers loaded with non-teaching responsibilities, pressurized with results and tests, and lacking adequate teaching learning materials struggle every day to impart quality education and needless to mention the overcrowded classrooms and deteriorating working conditions of the teachers. Teaching is not an attractive career and young generation is not interested to join the teaching profession. As such, you could see very, very clearly that there are enormous challenges and issues as per the preliminary findings I have shared with you. And that's why colleagues and friends, you can understand we need a very rigorous, very vigorous and very strong campaign on mobilizing education for all. Thank you very much for your attention and patience. Thank you very much, both the CB and uh, Sashi, our chief regional coordinators from Africa and Asia Pacific. We're going to move on to partner commitment statements. We want it on tape. We want our partners on tape that they commit to our Unite uh, campaign. So I, will, uh, I want to call on Mr. Adem Adubra, if you can come up to the table here, who is the uh, Chief of the Sectional Secretary for International Task Force on Teachers for EFA. Um, at the 8th Education for All high-level group meeting held in Oslo, Norway, they endorsed the establishment of the International Task Force on Teachers for EFA in December 2008. And uh, I'm rather proud because I was there. We will hear his statement and then we will also hear a statement from Mr. Oliver Liang from the Education Sector Specialist at the ILO. Mr. Lang has his, I have read, a PhD in history and gender studies. But remember also that the ILO supports international education goals through numerous decent work strategies. So they're looking at it from a different perspective. 
but they uh, certainly also support people who deliver education, say teachers. And we have Monique Fouillot, Chair of the Global Campaign for Education Board, which uh, the GCE, as we call it, is a civil society movement working to end the global education crisis, which has the mission to make sure that states act now to deliver the right for everyone to a free, quality public education. Along of, uh, many of you will also know that Monique uh, has a long-standing background in education international ever since it was created. We also, I also call on Ms. Pauline Greaves, Head of Education at the Commonwealth the Secretariat. It, they say on their website that education has been a priority area for Commonwealth governments since 1959 when ministers first met in Oxford. So they have a long-standing uh, commitment to education. We have Pauline? She's not here? Then we're just going to have to believe that the Commonwealth Secretariat does support us and is a partner. And uh, then we will now hear the partner statements from the Task Force on Teachers for EFA, from the ILO, and from the Global Campaign for Education. And if you can start, uh, Mr. Abdubra, and you just continue with Oliver and Monique. Okay? Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be at this event. The launch of a global year of action by the largest global teacher organization, Education International, on World Teachers' Day 2013 can only be applauded by the International Task Force on Teachers for EFA with its membership of nearly 90 national government, intergovernmental organization, bilateral donor agencies, civil society organization, private business and foundations. On behalf of the co-chairs of the task force, the members of its steering committee, the whole membership of this initiative, and the small team of the secretariat which I'm privileged to head, I would like to commend and congratulate Education International for this significant initiative at the eve of the penultimate year before the 2015 benchmark for Education for All and Millennium Development Goals. Education International is a founding member of the task force and member, the only member with UNESCO which has a permanent seat on the task force steering committee. The goal of the Global Alliance, which the International Task Force constitutes, is to bridge the teacher gaps declined from three perspectives. Policy gaps, whether the countries have the appropriate policies to address teacher issues. The capacity gap, whether they have the capacities to plan these policies, implement them, monitor them, evaluate them, and readapt them, and the financing gap. We heard from ACB that we cannot talk about teachers for all without thinking about resources. Since its inception in Oslo in 2008, the task force has paid close attention to the voice of teachers in the design and implementation of its actions and program. With the mandate of promoting coordination of international efforts in specific areas of teachers to maximize and streamline the use of diminishing resources available to offer quality education to all, the task force, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues, 
makes the campaign its own. Unite for Education. This will be the rallying motto to give new momentum and impetus to our call for teachers. The task force pledges full participation in the campaign. We will contribute by providing evidence data to support policy making. We will contribute by strengthening the capacity of decision makers to de develop appropriate policies, implement them and monitor them. We will contribute by bringing teacher stakeholders together in policy dialogue forum where they share knowledge and experiences. We will contribute by documenting existing policies and practices on teachers in all regions of the world, putting the emphasis on the underprivileged areas. For us and you alike, the Global Year of Action will never end until through our concerted actions, teacher policies and practices are revised and implemented and all learners, rich or poor, young or adult, male or female, rural or urban, whatever their specific learning needs, have access to well-prepared, justly remunerated, duly respected and highly committed teachers. Count on us. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of Guy Ryder, Director General of the International Labor Organization, I'm very pleased and proud to state that the International Labor Organization will support the United for Quality Education campaign. For the ILO, which deals with the world of work and labor issues, quality education is a key strategy. It, of course, improves the lives of learners. It's a key strategy for eliminating child labor. The International Labor Organization just released a report showing that although there is enormous progress in the last decade against child labor, still an estimated 168 million children work in child labor and don't have access to quality education as a result. Access to quality education is a key strategy for reducing this number even further. Education is also a key strategy for achieving gender equality, not only in the access of children to careers and, pro and prospects in life, but also, of course, to achieving gender equality within teaching ranks. And finally, and perhaps the most importantly, education is a key for employability. It's a key for creating sustainable economies in which the benefits of growth in those economies are justly distributed through work. And we know and we heard this morning that quality education will demand even more from learners and teachers in acquiring the skills that will be necessary for being competitive and gaining employability, either by finding work or by creating businesses and creating jobs in the coming century. Finally, for the ILO, a key perspective is that teachers, at the end of the day, are workers as well. Workers who have rights, who have to voice their rights, and who have to defend their rights uh, at the national and international level. For this reason, the ILO will continue to support the important principles of collective bargaining and freedom of association for teachers and teachers' unions. Just at our latest conference in June this year, a number of cases brought before our Committee on International Labor Standards dealt with serious violations of teachers' unions' rights. And these are troubling developments that we hope that international uh, labor standards will continue uh, to fight against. The ILO will also continue to work closely with our sister organization, UNESCO, to support the ILO UNESCO recommendation on the status of teachers which not only enunciates teachers' rights, but supports many other areas of learning and teaching, such as professional development, wages, hours of work, social security. We know that in order to attract 
and recruit and retain the best for this important profession, we need to create conditions which can retain the best in this profession. And that means not only good material conditions, good security, but also the autonomy and the creative space to pursue uh, what has rightly been called both a vocation and an art. And finally, just a quick note, we also must do more on the area of rural education. Because this area where they're attracting the best and the brightest is indeed a large challenge. And where indeed the economic challenges are extremely severe is where the ILO has also started putting some uh, emphasis on. Uh, we are currently launching an initiative on the rural economy, and we hope to include access to public services, including education, in this important work. So to conclude, I don't think there is a better time for such a campaign. This campaign will be very important for many agencies as they begin their work in the context of the post-2015 development framework. And we can only congratulate uh, EI on this important initiative, and we look forward to collaborating with them and its many partners in making this a very successful campaign. Thank you. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers, euh, chers amis, chers collègues, chers amis de l'International de l'Éducation, euh, permettez-moi, au nom de la campagne mondiale de l'Éducation, de ses membres, de son bureau exécutif, de remercier l'International de l'Éducation de nous avoir euh, invités à participer au lancement de cette importante initiative euh, « Unie pour l'éducation, une éducation pour un monde meilleur ». Il y a 14 ans, et certains d'entre vous ici présents s'en souviennent probablement, à l'automne 1999, quelques mois avant le Forum mondial pour l'éducation pour tous de Dakar, l'International de l'éducation, lancé à Bruxelles avec d'autres partenaires, ActionAid International, Oxfam International, la Marche mondiale contre le travail des enfants et quelques autres organisations régionales et nationales, lancé, disais-je, la campagne mondiale pour l'éducation. Cette coalition mondiale s'est développée et 14 ans après, nous regroupons aujourd'hui une centaine d'organisations de coalitions nationales composées d'organisations de la société civile, de syndicats d'enseignants, d'associations de parents, d'organisations communautaires, d'organisations de femmes et d'autres partenaires clés défendant et plaidant pour le droit à l'éducation pour tous et surtout pour sa réelle mise en œuvre. L'IE est toujours là et occupe une place centrale au sein de cette alliance. Nous nous sommes unis, nous avons su surmonter nos différences, et je crois que nous avons réussi à faire de notre diversité un atout pour nous battre ensemble afin que l'éducation pour tous devienne une réalité. Je crois que nous pouvons être fiers, car l'éducation est probablement le seul secteur où nous avons réussi, et depuis plus d'une décennie, les syndicats d'enseignants les ONG ainsi que d'autres partenaires travaillent ensemble pour avancer, pour que le droit à l'éducation pour tous devienne cette réalité. Cette relation étroite que nous avons su nouer depuis une décennie, ce travail collectif, ce « travailler ensemble » comme nous disons, nous permet de nous exprimer d'une seule voix, renforçant ainsi, j'en suis persuadée, notre poids moral et politique. Une alliance significative de la société civile aujourd'hui en faveur de l'éducation pour tous ne pourrait et ne saurait exister sans la voix forte des enseignants portée par leurs organisations représentatives. Au nom de la campagne, je voudrais donc dire que nous soutenons bien sûr cette initiative et son thème. Comme vous venez de le dire, Olivier Lang, cette campagne vient à point nommé, au moment où des organisations, les, la communauté internationale, l'UNESCO, les Nations Unies, évaluent ce qui avait été décidé en 2000, les objectifs du millénaire pour le développement, les objectifs de Dakar, et alors même que la même communauté internationale s'interroge sur « qu'allons-nous faire après 2015 ?», la campagne vient à point nommé pour rappeler un certain nombre de choses. Et je crois que les enseignants le savent. Les choses se répètent, mais il faut répéter, répéter, répéter pour convaincre. 
Nous sommes donc pleinement engagés aux côtés de l'international de l'éducation sur cette campagne, car nous savons tous, bien sûr, que l'amélioration de la qualité est un des défis aujourd'hui de l'agenda de l'EPT et que le droit à l'éducation ne pourra être réalisé si l'accent n'est pas mis davantage sur ces questions de qualité. Nous sommes convaincus, et plusieurs intervenants depuis ce matin l'ont l'ont indiqué dans leurs interventions, que mettre l'accent sur la qualité de l'éducation implique également que l'on mette l'accent sur la qualité des enseignants. Les enseignants sont le déterminant essentiel. C'est pour cela que l'aspect majeur de cette crise de la qualité de l'éducation au niveau mondial, c'est bien aujourd'hui le manque d'enseignants qualifiés au niveau de l'enseignement primaire et du secondaire. Aujourd'hui, s'assurer que chaque enfant à un enseignant bien formé, motivé et soutenu est le meilleur moyen pour faire en sorte que chaque apprenant, qu'il s'agisse d'un enfant, d'un jeune ou d'un adulte, ait accès à une éducation de qualité. C'est pour cela que nous avions choisi cette année en 2013 comme thème de la semaine mondiale d'action et de sa campagne phare en 2013, chaque enfant a besoin d'un enseignant. Nous avons également lancé conjointement avec l'IE un rapport sur les, les enseignants et sur les condi leurs conditions de travail et, de, et leur, euh, leur statut et leur développement professionnel. Mais je ne m'étendrai pas, on en a beaucoup parlé depuis ce matin. Aujourd'hui, au prétexte de la crise, et pour utiliser la terminologie anglaise, la mode est au low cost, low cost education, low status job pour les enseignants. Cela ne pourra nous conduire qu'à une « low quality education ». Il nous faut donc continuer à argumenter, à plaider pour convaincre, mais convaincre bien sûr au-delà de nos cercles. Les coalitions membres de la campagne cette année ont pris des initiatives et continueront à prendre des initiatives et à se rapprocher des syndicats d'enseignants afin que de joindre leurs efforts, afin d'atteindre cet objectif d'une éducation de qualité pour tous et pour un monde meilleur. Bonne chance à cette initiative. Rendez-vous dans un an. Et oui, Fred, je crois qu'ensemble, nous pouvons faire la différence. Merci. Thank you so much, all three of you, for your commitment statements. We know you are our partners and we look forward to future cooperation. Now, I am going to introduce a representative for another good friend who is going to introduce another good friend. The Open Society Foundations, have, we have cooperated a lot with them and they have uh, supported so many young people so that they could access quality education. On their website they very often refer to their founder, George Soros, and what he once said. Our understanding of the world is inherently imperfect. What is imperfect can be improved. I think that is perfect. We have something imperfect that we need together to improve. So let me introduce, on be, who represents the Open Society Foundation, Hugh McLean, who himself is a teacher who has uh, taught several places, as far as I can figure out, in uh, South Africa, several age groups, both within trade unions, adult education, also when you look to primary and secondary, so you really have the whole scope. Here you are, you. Thanks very much, and uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce someone who needs no introduction. That's always a nice thing to do on an afternoon, so late in the afternoon. But I would like to introduce to you Andreas Schleicher of the OECD. Um, Andreas heads the International Global Comparisons at the OECD, the PISA studies most of you know. He's been there for almost 20 years, Andreas, but not quite. We won't uh, go, go into that. But I think I should say that the uh, PISA studies, as we know, have become incredibly significant in terms of shaping educational uh, policy. They've become a centerpiece of the discussion around education development uh, globally. And really interestingly for us this afternoon, they have shown at each point that quality education 
is not possible without quality teachers. And the great strength, I think, about the work of the OECD that it has shown with an independent study and a look at the data that the importance of teaching as a profession is fundamental to what we're trying to achieve. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Andre Schleicher, who will tell us a bit about his work at the OECD and the role of international comparative testing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hugh, for the kind introduction. And I would like to start by congratulating International Ed uh, Education International for this initiative, initiative for quality education. We need that now more than ever. You can see right across the world that there is a growing gap between the life chances of those who are better skilled and the life chances of those who are struggling with the transition to the knowledge economy. You see that within countries, you see that across countries, and it's clear the only answer to this is better education for more people. The lessons from our work at the OECD are very simple. You look at the PISA comparison, and you can conclude that the quality of education can never exceed the quality of its teachers. And the quality of teachers can never exceed the kind of work organization learning organization support that we build around those teachers. So that's really as simple as that. And the challenges are not going to go away, actually, if you look a little bit to the future. The work for teachers is going to be ever tougher. You can see how income inequality is growing across our countries. And this is right across the industrialized world and also in many other countries beyond that. And you can see, actually, again, this is driven by inequality in skills that we have. You can look at this in other ways. You know, if you see any rising share of young people growing up in single households, where are the problems that are going to end up on the doorsteps of schools and teachers? We expect teachers to take over a lot of the things that families can no longer provide. Migration. We're seeing a rapidly pacing increase in the migration towards the industrialized world. Once again, where do the challenges and issues end up on the doorsteps of teachers? Increasing diversity in classrooms, and the trend is not going to be ending. It's going to be continuing. Growing knowledge intensity. If you look at the increasing number of people working in research and development right across the industrialized world, you can actually see the demands that we put on our schools in terms of not only maintaining quality but raising quality are going to be further accelerating. That's what the world of teachers is going to look like. So what do we expect from teachers in the 21st century? Well, it's not only to do with transmitting lots of knowledge, but also finding, giving students a sense of where they understand themselves, fostering genuine engagement. Lifelong learning is only going to ha happen if students get not only good knowledge, but actually become motivated learners. It has to be to this focusing on lifelong skills-oriented learning instead of just certifying initial education. It has to do with being acutely sensitive to individual difference. It's this idea of personalizing learning, one of the biggest challenges that teachers report themselves when we surveyed them in our TALIS survey. Continual assessment, formative feedback, every day knowing where are we standing as students, as teachers, as school system, every day Again, another of those demands placed on teachers. Being demanding to every student. One of the things that our PISA study show very clearly that students do better, where teachers expect a lot from them and where teachers support them individually. Again, one of the things that's going to rise in demand. Fostering relevant learning. Making sure that learning is not only sort of transmitting the knowledge of the past, but actually relating to the future of young people. Again. How do teachers actually are going to manage this? Ensuring that learning is social and collaborative. Why is it so important? Because the world of work increasingly demands the capacity of people to relate well to others, to manage and resolve conflicts, to work with each other. Innovation is no longer you having a great idea and doing a great idea, but about you being able to share your, your ideas with other people. Promoting connections across subjects. In the past, you could say, well, I'm teaching mathematics, or I teach geography, or I teach language. Today, we expect teachers to work across those kind of subject matter disciplines, because we expect students to be able to think through the boundaries of subject disciplines. So again, the world is going to look a very, and the expectations on teachers are going to be ever increasing. 
So what does it mean? It's a tough challenge, no? And I've seen that slide before, you know, rising up to this mountain. You, there are a lot of dangers and pitfalls here. But we know the answer to this is basically preparing, developing, retaining, and supporting effective teachers. How does it look in practice? Actually, the good news is some countries are there today. You know, some countries that comes from our comparisons show us this is actually not a remote, abstract perspective, but it's happening today. Finland has made teaching the second most attractive occupation. Everybody wants to become a teacher. And it's not just because pay. Pay is okay, but it's not great in Finland. It's because teaching has become such a supportive environment. You have real perspectives for development. You work every day with your colleagues. You are supported by society. You have a relatively high status. This is something we can see it can be done. What does it take, actually? Of course, you want teachers to be very well prepared in the subjects that they teach. Of course, we take that for granted, but those subjects continue to evolve. You want teachers to be very, very good at mastering a very wide range of pedagogic strategies, ensuring that they can adapt their strategies to a growing diversity of learners. And here's a chart that's a bit, actually, before I introduce it, it's this data. When we survey teachers across the OECD countries, most teachers have a very good sense of what good teaching looks like. The kind of teaching strategies that are ideal for teaching students. But when we ask the teachers what actually happens in classroom, in your own classroom, we got that. Telling, teachers telling us basically, well, you know, I teach in pretty classical ways. I have a little bit of student-oriented teaching practices and very little opportunity for using enhanced teaching activities. The kind of things that you would really want to do as a teacher. Most teachers say, this is what I want to do, but they are not doing it. And if that is happening consistently in classrooms across schools, we need to ask ourselves, what are the barriers for making those kind of things happen? Teachers need to have a deep understanding of how learning happens, fostering the kind of initiative and creative skills. Again, our data show that some countries have made very important progress towards this goal. I want to show you one picture from Japan. You know, when you think about Japan and many other East Asian countries, you have this idea, well, they foster a lot of rope learning, but they're not the great creative thinkers. May have been true in the past, but lots of things have been changing. Again, to show you that this can be done, this is basically the performance improvement on different types of tasks. On the left side, you have sort of the classical reproduction of subject matter content that you can test with multiple choice tests. On the right side, you have students' capacity to solve open-ended tasks, where you need to actually produce, create new knowledge. No? I mean, you can see actually across the industrialized world, at least we have seen progress. No? The world has shifted more to the right side. Students are becoming better in being more creative. But when you look at a country like Japan, it has seen progress there and a lot more progress there. And I'm telling you this because this has to do with what happens actually in the classroom. Within a relatively short period of time, you can actually change what happens in the classroom by providing a better environment for teachers to work and collaborate. It has to do with giving teachers more opportunities to reflect on their practice and learn from their experience. Sweden is a very interesting case where you actually have principals every day challenging their staff. You know, how do we know? that what we do is the right thing to do. Could we test another way of doing it? What do we know about other people in other schools doing the kind of thing, creating this kind of profession, not having teachers working in isolation in their classroom, but connecting people, connecting minds, connecting schools, spreading innovation throughout the system. That's the future. It has to do with enabling teachers to work in collaborative ways. And a very, very good examples when you look to Canada and Ontario, Ontario's leadership strategy, bringing the profession together, again, creating a profession rather than keeping teachers in a very industrial work organization. Or you go to the other side of the world, in Singapore, you have that happening, not, maybe not so much at the level of the system, but in many of the schools where you have a lot of emphasis on professional learning communities. So encouraging science, those things are happening. Technology skills. No? Another dimension where many of our education systems are struggling, where we need to become a lot better. And last but not least, perhaps the biggest challenge is how do we actually su succeed to attract the most talented teachers into the most challenging classrooms? And how, would you get, how do we get the, the best principals into the toughest schools? 
When you look actually in many countries in the OECD, we are becoming better at investing more in education. Huh? Investment in education in many countries keeps the rise. But we are putting more of the same people into the institutions and the, insti the, the schools and learning environments in the most disadvantaged areas are suffering most. They get fewer teachers, often teachers with fewer qualifications and so on. So how do we change this? But there are very good examples again. China, many provinces in China have made a lot of progress in changing those dynamics, putting the best resources to where they can make most of a difference. One of the things that is very clear from our comparisons is, you know, if you, if you are born in a privileged family, it doesn't matter whether you go to school in Finland or United States or Brazil or China, people come out quite similarly. Their education systems really make a difference is for children that don't have it from their own social background. So what can we actually do as governments to help? That's, of course, a very important question that we at the OECD ask ourselves, and I want to conclude with this. A couple of points. First, of course, and this is the obvious, no? provide adequate resources to attract, develop, and retain highly qualified teachers. Very simple, you know, still a lot of things to do. Second, make sure that every child benefits from excellent instruction. Making sure that we deploy the resources where they actually have an impact. I think there is progress. I'm confident, actually, in terms of raising more resources. Countries are beginning to understand that education today is their economy and their future tomorrow. So there is flowing more money into education. But there's a lot more work to do to actually allocate those resources properly. But there's uncertainty. You know, everybody likes the status quo. You know, the world is changing very rapidly. We're very comfortable with the situations in which we work. And systems need to become a lot better at communicating and building support for challenge. Top-down reform no longer works. You really need to convince everybody. And this is not just teachers and school principals. It's to do with parents, with students. Education is everybody's business. Now. Getting people on board, making the case for change. It has to do with making reforms work. And that, again, comes back building consensus, so finding what the right ideas are, bringing teachers into the reform design, not just at the stage of implementation. Some countries are doing it, it can be done, but we're not doing it yet widespread enough. We still have this idea, you know, we have an industrial work organization. Someone figures out what's to be done and then we try to do it in lots of places. It no longer works in the knowledge economy. The best minister of education cannot solve the problem of 100,000 schools and millions of, te uh, of teachers and children. You need to get the ideas from the millions of teachers and students together to solve the problem of the one education system. It has to do with, you know, underpinning reform with solid analysis and research. We have lots of ideas in education, lots of beliefs, lots of ideologies. We're just at the beginning to develop robust evidence of data. And that's not just a matter of, you know, governments, organizations like UNESCO or the OECD. It's very much a task for the profession. If you work in medicine today, you know, who does research in medicine? Universities? Well, some. Institutions? Some. Most of the research in medicine is done by practitioners. People actually work in the field, who do the work, who know the work. If you look to education, well, you know, there's a big gap between practice and research. We need to become better at this. OECD is working hard on that. You know that. Making teachers active agents, not just, again, in the implementation of reform, but actually in the way in which reforms are designed. Also, we know that, you know, conflict between unions and reform has best been avoided not when unions are weak, but when they're actually strong and when they cooperate with reform and are involved in reform. And again, there are very good examples right across the world, but there are also many bad examples. We have to learn how to do those things better. And finally, in concluding, what is the past? What is the future going to look like? In the past, you know, we could actually be tolerating failure in the system. You only needed a few people to be well educated because a lot of jobs were only requiring poor levels of education. Today, that doesn't work anymore. Failure, education failure has a huge cost for individuals and societies. We also need to think about the kind of skills. In the past, we could think about routine cognitive skills. You teach students something, and that's going to make them successful for their life. Well, today, you know, maybe 10 years down, it works. If you think 20 years down, you're going to struggle if you cannot adapt your knowledge, if you cannot continue to learn, if you cannot manage complex ways of thinking, if you cannot manage complex ways of working. 
And that has fundamental implications on the quality of teaching. When you can think of, you know, the role of a teacher is just to teach a curriculum, well, you know, you can deal with average people. But when you think about those other people who have to invent instruction, who have to develop instruction, tailor instruction, personalized learning, you have to rely on a high quality uh, profession. And those people do not like to work in tailoristic work organizations. No? You never attract, even with doubling and tripling salaries, you're never going to attract high quality people into a work organization you know, where they are just exchangeable widgets on an assembly line. You need to think about flat, collegial, differentiated, and diverse careers. A challenge for the profession, a challenge for governments. And finally, that has implications on the way in which we talk about things like professional autonomy and a collaborative culture. Thank you very much. We have no time for questions, <laughs> but um, I'd like to thank uh, Andre Schleicher, OECD, and the work that they've done. And uh, we look forward, I think, to continued collaboration with, uh, with teaching as a profession and the work that is coming out of the OECD. So thank you very, very much. Thanks. Oh, how we would have wished that we had the double amount of time we had so we could have asked all our questions. But we're going to move on to our Global Teachers Forum. And I'm going to give uh, the floor to a, a more professional moderator. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to introduce Ed Jarrell. But I think I'd start by saying that there's one... Uh, I have changed jobs this year. I started the 1st of January in the new job in Education International. And there's one thing that has been very bad for me doing that. Because sitting in Oslo, I receive Times Educational Supplement every week at work. Now that I have two homes, I cannot have all this paper in my mailbox. So please, can you develop an app for my iPad? You have got an app now, because you didn't have the app the last time I looked. So if Tess has got an app, that is very good. And uh, they have an editor for their features and comments editor, I think you are now, that has on uh, the internet, they say that his best tweet is as follows. The internet is an exceptional argument for why society needs both teachers and trustworthy journalism. I thought that was very good that you did that. So Ed, now, you may moderate, not on the internet, but it's being webcast. A teacher's forum. The floor is uh, yours. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank EI for organizing this fantastic day. I'm told this is the Global Teachers Forum. We're here to discuss what the barriers are to bring about a better quality education for all. From a personal perspective, I can vouch for the enormous desire of teachers around the world to improve education and share resources. We have uh, on our website the most fantastic resource sharing uh, facility. Two and a half million teachers, many of your members will be there doing it for free. It's absolutely fantastic. But while, uh, while the internet brings down barriers, other barriers are being brought up all the time. Um, so I'm fascinated to hear what our panel has got to say. Uh, I believe, first up, Christine. Well, first up, we have Christine Blower. Uh, she's General Secretary of the NUT and also, I believe, representing the UK. And then we have Ms. Mariam Sacco, forgive the pronunciation, Dan Zacco for General Secretary of Cypros in Senegal. And do we not have the other person here? Are we looking for a Mr. Roberto Franklin Delau? He's here. Come on up. So.
So each of our, each of our speakers is going to uh, analyze the major barriers to better quality education, um, but also make commitments from their own teacher organizations about what they're going to do in this year of action. So shall I suggest we go first with Christine? Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Ed, and I am uh, honored and absolutely delighted uh, to be here. As we all know, education is central to a fair and just society, and it's key to liberation and empowerment of all. It's key to helping lift people out of poverty, and it's key, as international evidence uh, and experience shows, it's a key to improving the life chances and health of all, and in particular, probably that of girls. And of course, central to quality, to quality education is well-qualified, properly paid, respected and well-motivated teachers. A teaching force with confidence uh, and well-resourced is critical to the job. And it's for these reasons that the NUT remains deeply committed to the global campaign for education and to international solidarity with teachers' unions. We will indeed in this year continue to mobilize our members and through them, the young people whom they teach, to militate for global social justice. NUT members focus on this, particularly on Education for All Day in June, but actually throughout the year we find opportunities within the curriculum to address these issues, ranging from familiarity with the UN Charter on the Rights of the Child to threats to the entire planet from climate change and the need for, for tax justice internationally. So we believe that we take our professional responsibility to alert young people to global issues extremely seriously. We have, after all, in our classrooms today, the next generations of, of, of politicians, but more importantly, the next generation of teachers. We take it as our mission to do our very best to ensure that the young people who leave our schools and higher education institutions are as equipped in empathy and activism as they are in the range of academic, technical and vocational subjects. It is our mission to imbue them with the certain knowledge that education is a right and not a privilege. And so I turn to the specific plans that we have in the NUT in terms of our teacher trade union activity uh, during this particular campaigning year. In England, and to the extent that the writ of the UK government runs in Wales, we have seen a plethora of policies which teachers and their unions find unacceptable. These cover the bread and butter union issues of pay, in particular performance related pay and the destruction of our national pay framework, but our concerns go so much wider than these. For example, in contradistinction to high performing jurisdictions, which seek ever more highly qualified teachers, in England, our Secretary of State has removed the requirement for qualified teacher status from very many schools. We see the fragmentation and possible privatization of our, of our education system and much of what Parsi Salberg, Finnish education expert, characterizes as the global education reform movement. You will note that the acronym GERM is well chosen. Tests, targets, league tables, attempts to restrict the curriculum, those things exemplified in Fred Van Leeuwen's opening remarks. So against the background of government policy like this, the NUT has taken the view that we need, in this year of uniting for quality education, to work with others to, prevent, to present a comprehensive and coherent alternative for the education service in England and Wales. And to this end, we have established an inquiry alongside a progressive left-wing think tank uh, called Compass, which operates in England. The purpose of this inquiry is to answer the question, what is a good education and how do we provide it? We have set up an advisory council drawn from across society, alongside our own members and our usual friends and allies in academia and the voluntary sector with a concern for social justice and children's welfare, and of course, parents and students. We also have on the advisory council those with whom we spend less time, 
representatives from business and industry. We will also have international input from Parsi Salberg and indeed from our colleagues in Canada. And we may even ask Andreas if he would like to come along and make a presentation to us. The inquiry is working on four themes. Vision and values, curriculum and assessment, teacher professionalism, and governance. How schools are provided, how they are funded, and to whom they are accountable. There are, of course, significant overlaps in these four areas. The initial meeting of this advisory council is taking place in London today at NUT headquarters. It's very well timed just ahead of World Teachers Day tomorrow. Our plan is that the outcomes from this inquiry will gather evidence in a variety of ways over this autumn, winter and spring and will provide a platform from which to lobby our political parties on education policy ahead of our next general election. As Andreas told us just a few moments ago, most teachers know what good practice looks like. So we will be interested to hear from these other people, but we think a significant amount of input will come from our own members. We see then this activity as chiming perfectly with the theme of Unite for Quality Education. As teachers, and particularly as teacher trade unionists, we are, both, we are united by both international solidarity and a deep-seated belief that a better world is possible. The National Union of Teachers will continue to strive for that better world through better education, through quality education, alongside our friends and colleagues in Education International, with whom we share the conviction that quality teaching, quality tools for the job, and a quality environment are essential precursors to a quality education and must be available to every child, everywhere, every day. Thank you very much. And next up we've got uh, from Senegal, Mariam Soko Dan Soko. If that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Salut, camarades, collègues, invités. Je voudrais profiter de cette occasion pour dire félicitations et merci aux millions d'enseignantes et d'enseignants à travers le monde pour services rendus et qu'ils continuent à rendre à l'humanité. Pour ce qui concerne notre longue marche vers notre idéal, une éducation publique de qualité. Je voudrais dire que dans mon pays, des efforts sont consentis par le gouvernement, bien sûr avec l'appui des partenaires techniques et financiers, mais surtout par la mobilisation et la pression des organisations syndicales de l'enseignement. Des efforts dans le domaine de l'accès, l'amélioration de l'accès, l'amélioration de l'environnement des enseignements apprentissage avec les infrastructures et l'équipement, la motivation des enseignants relativement à leur plan de carrière et à leur formation. Mais cependant, force est de constater qu'il reste encore beaucoup à faire, beaucoup de défis qui interpellent. Il s'agit du défi de la qualité pour que nos écoles ne restent pas des garderies pour de grands enfants, pour que dans chaque classe, il puisse y avoir un enseignant de qualité parce que qualifié et motivé. Le défi de l'équité pour que disparaissent les disparités multiformes au niveau des enseignements, mais également au niveau du traitement des enseignants. Le défi de la qualité du partenariat et du dialogue social. Je pense que c'est un défi à relever pour que les enseignants et leurs organisations 
ne soient plus considérés comme des empêcheurs de tourner rond, mais qu'ils soient considérés comme des partenaires, des forces de proposition au bénéfice de l'école et du système éducatif globalement. Qu'ils soient consultés, qu'ils soient également au niveau des structures de pilotage et de gestion du système éducatif. Et c'est pourquoi nous pensons que améliorer la condition enseignante, restaurer sa dignité et la considération qui, qui est due à l'enseignant, restaurer un service public de qualité, reste des défis pour la profession enseignante et les organisations syndicales. Aussi, les syndicats continuent de s'organiser, de se mobiliser, de lutter pour porter le plaidoyer et exiger des gouvernants la prise en main de ces défis et de ces menaces afin de garantir à chaque enfant un enseignant de qualité, mais aussi une éducation publique gratuite et universelle. Et c'est dans ce cadre-là que nous magnifions et qu'il convient de magnifier l'initiative de l'International de l'Éducation avec cette année de mobilisation. Une initiative qui est partagée par ses affiliés. En tout cas, pour ce qui nous concerne au Sénégal, le CIPROS plus particulièrement, nous avons, soucieux de, du devenir de l'école publique et de la qualité de l'éducation et de la formation, nous avons développé des initiatives des projets de lutte contre le VIH-Sida, projets de lutte contre les violences à l'école pour garantir l'éthique, la déontologie et assurer un environnement sûr et sain. Projets d'acquisition d'ordinateurs pour que les enseignants soient à niveau, qu'ils ne soient pas dépassés par leur, leurs élèves. On sait que leur salaire ne leur permet pas de vivre correctement, de prendre en charge leur famille et de s'octroyer ces outils modernes. L'habitat social, nous sommes tous convaincus que 75% de, du travail de l'enseignant se fait à domicile. Des, certaines conditions de logement ne permettent pas de s'acquitter correctement de ce, de ce travail. L'organisation de débats et de réflexions sur les questions de l'éducation, mais aussi et surtout le soutien et l'accompagnement de jeunes enseignants. Nous savons que dans notre pays, moins de 50% des enseignants seulement sont qualifiés avec le système de recrutement que, qui a fait le tour du monde et connu de tous, le système de recrutement de volontaires et de, et de vacataires. C'est un travail, c'est un rôle régalien de l'État, mais que les organisations syndicales, en tout cas, se chargent de faire auprès de leurs jeunes camarades. Pour la présente campagne au Sénégal, nous nous engageons à bâtir une coalition forte afin que l'éducation et la formation en tant qu'instrument pour le développement économique, social, culturel et environnemental des peuples occupe une place et un rôle prépondérant dans le nouveau cadre pour le développement durable. Et pour cela, nous avons un plan d'action qui tourne autour de renforcement de capacités pour la vulgarisation et l'appropriation du processus de l'agenda post-2015, mais aussi des campagnes de sensibilisation auprès des, des acteurs, élèves étudiants, parents d'élèves, des ONG, mais aussi des décideurs, gouvernements, parlements, élus locaux, pour que cet idéal d'éducation publique de qualité soit pris en charge par tous et que ça ne soit pas seulement l'affaire des, des enseignants. Nous envisageons également de, une sensibilisation 
de grande masse à travers des temps d'antenne, des débats radio-télévisés, en tout cas sur la problématique de l'éducation. Nous réitérons en tout cas notre détermination et notre engagement à poursuivre notre combat quotidien, celui des enseignants, à dispenser un enseignement de qualité pour une éducation de qualité. Alors nous disons plein succès à cette année de campagne, unie pour l'éducation, une éducation de qualité pour un monde meilleur. Je vous remercie. Merci. Uh, and now we have the president of the National Confederation of Education Workers in Brazil, Roberto Franklin de Liao. Boa tarde a todos e todas. É um prazer estar participando deste evento que trata da educação de qualidade. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to take part in this event that uh, talks about quality education. Quero começar dizendo o seguinte. É, eu não acho que a qualidade da educação dependa apenas da boa formação dos professores. I would like to start by saying that uh, I don't believe a quality of education depends exclusively on the quality of training that teachers receive. É necessário investimento. Outras variáveis, portanto, são fundamentais para que tenhamos qualidade na educação e na educação pública. It is necessary then that we invest because there are other variables, other elements that are required for us to achieve a quality public education. E quero também lembrar o seguinte: qualidade é um conceito em disputa na sociedade. I would De also like to remind that quality is a concept that is discussed within society. There are various opinions on quality. E, e a qualidade que nós defendemos é uma qualidade libertadora e não uma qualidade do puro treinamento. Para nós, a educação é algo que vai além de saber manejar bem um instrumento qualquer. For us, quality is supposed to liberate. It is not only about training and preparing people for, in, for using a tool, whatever that tool is. It is supposed to liberate people. É a qualidade a que me refiro é a qualidade que deve preparar as pessoas para enfrentarem os desafios do mundo. So the quality I refer to is the quality that prepares people to face the challenges of the current world. Sabendo se colocar como cidadão ou cidadã, sendo capaz de decidir por si being able to position himself herself as a citizen and to make decisions for himself or for herself. É, quando falei em investimento, eu considero que o mundo, e a começar do meu país, o Brasil, investe pouco em educação. Well, I refer to investment because I consider that the world and in, in, in particular my country, Brazil, invests too little in education. Investe pouco, é claro entendendo a educação como nós entendemos, com a qualidade que eu acabei de me expressar aqui. Of course, I mean that investments are not up to our expectations, considering our view of quality that I have just expressed. No Brasil, nós fazemos uma luta, no momento, uma luta que já vem de alguns anos, mas que agora está mais acirrada, que é por, para que 10% do produto interno bruto brasileiro seja, sejam investidos em educação pública. In Brazil, we have been struggling for many years, and we have uh, intensified our efforts recently to make sure that 10%, at least 10% of GDP is invested in education. 
No dia de hoje e durante os próximos dias, como já o fizemos no mês anterior, a CNTE organiza um acampamento em frente ao Congresso Nacional do Brasil para fazer com que os deputados e os senadores da República compreendam a necessidade de votarem um Plano Nacional de Educação que contemple essa reivindicação histórica da sociedade brasileira. 10% do PIB para o investimento em educação pública. So in the coming days, as we have been doing for the past months, CNT, the Brazilian Teachers Confederation, will be uh, camping in front uh, of uh, Parliament and Congress to make sure that uh, members of Congress and senators are convinced that it is a need for the country to approve a national education plan, plan that envisages at least 10% of uh, gross domestic product for education. No Brasil, nós acreditamos que a educação de qualidade socialmente referenciada, a que me referi há pouco, ela se funda em três pontos principais. Valorização profissional dos trabalhadores em educação, não apenas dos docentes, porque entendemos que os trabalhadores que atuam em atividades de apoio nas escolas precisam ser valorizados também. Em investimento, é o outro, outro ponto, e gestão democrática da educação. Investimento, como já falei, o investimento mínimo dos 10% do PIB na educação. E a gestão democrática é, para nós, um ponto fundante também. Por quê? Porque permite o controle social do investimento em educação. So we, be, uh, we believe that quality is based on three points. First of all, uh, the valorization of education workers, and by that I mean not only teachers, but education support staff. We believe that it is essential that they are valued accordingly. Investment, as mentioned uh, before, at least 10% of GDP should be invested in education. And finally, democratic governance of education funding. It is fundamental that society is able to play a role in controlling and making decisions as far as funding of education, of public education is concerned. Para nós, gestão democrática significa poder construir um projeto político-pedagógico das escolas na própria escola, junto com a comunidade escolar, além de professores, de funcionários, a, so, a população do entorno da escola deve ter o direito de participar do projeto político-pedagógico da escola. Esses três pontos são fundamentais para nós. E valorização não é apenas o salário, que é fundamental para nós. Temos uma luta no Brasil para a implementação de uma lei que diz respeito a um piso salarial profissional nacional para todos os, os professores. Ainda não, não conseguimos que seja para todos os trabalhadores de educação, mas é uma luta que está colocada e que nós estamos fazendo com muita determinação. So he insists that the democratic governance is essential. Uh, this is a way to enable the community, teachers, education support staff, students, parents to participate and to play a role in building together the political and pedagogical uh, project of the school and the vision of, of, of the school. Uh, the community has the right to participate in building the political and, pedago and pedagogical project of the school. And he insists that valuing uh, professionals is not only a matter of salary. He emphasizes that um, recently uh, Brazil has approved a law, national law, for a minimum salary for teachers, but this is at this point in time exclusive to teachers only, and that CNT is still struggling to make sure that this minimum national salary for, uh, is also extended to uh, education support staff. Além da questão salarial, no, consideramos que é importante na valorização uma formação inicial 
sólida, consistente e que não seja a famosa educação por competência, que não seja a, educação, a formação do conhecimento, habilidade e atitude, que não seja a formação do saber um pouco do conteúdo, saber transmitir esse pouco conteúdo e ter uma atitude complacente com tudo o que está acontecendo. A educação para nós, a formação de um professor deve passar por, por conhecimentos que vão muito além do simples conhecer o conteúdo da sua disciplina, mas pelo entendimento de qual o papel que ele tem na sociedade. A outra questão fundamental é que tenhamos carreira que atraiam o jovem para a profissão. Nós temos um grande número, de, temos uma grande falta de professores, porque os jovens não são atraídos para a profissão que não lhes oferece perspectiva de futuro. Os professores recebem muito mal e trabalham em péssimas condições, em condições muito ruins, e não têm a tranquilidade de uma carreira que lhes apresente um futuro. Então, ele insiste que, em termos de treinamento, Uh, the vision of CNT is that the training for teachers needs to be solid and thorough and not only based on, competency, on competencies and knowledge and, and being able to transmit that knowledge, but training to be really quality training has to enable teachers to understand the role that they play in society beyond uh, mere uh, mastery of uh, whatever subject is being taught. Uh, and one big obstacle at the moment is the need to attract younger, uh, uh, younger, uh, young teachers, uh, young candidates to the profession. It is a very difficult profession. Teachers are, are, are not being uh, paid accordingly and working under very bad and very difficult circumstances. And this is not attracting which, uh, teachers, new young teachers, which is therefore causing a serious problem of shortage in the country. Concluindo. Feito. O tempo é pouco, o tempo é pequeno para a gente discutir um pouco mais. Mas quero reafirmar aqui aquilo que é uma tradição nossa e de, tenho certeza de todos os sindicatos que compõem a Internacional da Educação, que é continuar fazendo a, ilu, a luta por uma educação de qualidade, socialmente referenciada, por uma valorização dos profissionais da educação, porque só com profissionais valorizados, só com um investimento e com gestão democrática, nós teremos uma educação efetivamente capaz de promover uma educação com equidade, uma educação inclusiva, capaz de promover um mundo melhor, que é o mundo que nós tanto sonhamos. No mundo onde as pessoas sejam felizes, os trabalhadores felizes e todos nós possamos viver com tranquilidade. Muito obrigado. E até outro dia. To conclude, because time is short, to reaffirm uh, our commitment, as is our, our tradition as EI members, as trade unions, that will continue to stand for quality education that is important for a society and that requires investment, that requires democratic governance and that promotes equity education that is inclusive, because it is only this way that we will build the better world that we all want, a world that workers are happy, where students are happy, and where we can all live in peace. A round of applause for the translator. Uh, I thank to all three of you for those fine, fine words. Um, I think we've, I've been told, the great timekeeping overlords have told me that we've got five minutes for questions. So does anyone want to say anything at all? Christine says we should uh, give it up. Okay, well, in that case, I'd like to thank everyone here. <laughs> And uh, especially from the Times Education Supplement, happy World Teacher Day.
Merci. On m'a demandé de dire quelques mots pour clôturer, en quelque sorte, le lancement de cette, cette campagne. Je voudrais, pour commencer, rappeler que l'UNESCO salue cette initiative de l'International de l'Éducation, initiative placée sous la, sous la bannière de la qualité de, de l'éducation. Et je voudrais peut-être remarquer à cette occasion que la, la qualité, c'est peut-être un, un objectif insaisissable pour les, les éducateurs. En fait, c'est certainement une notion évolutive. C'est également pour l'UNESCO l'un de nos axes prioritaires. Et on l'a évoqué ce matin. Cela se traduit notamment par la priorité donnée aux enseignants comme étant effectivement pour nous aussi, comme pour Éducation internationale, le déterminant clé pour la, la qualité de l'éducation. Et je voudrais euh, rappeler que l'UNESCO a, a lancé, il y a un peu, un peu moins d'un an, une nouvelle stratégie euh, pour les enseignants, euh, stratégie qui est centrée sur euh, la question et la problématique de la professionnalisation, avec bien sûr un, un axe sur les questions de, de formation euh, initiale euh, continue, mais au-delà de la formation sur les questions d'accompagnement euh, des enseignants. Euh, un axe également sur la, la question des, des cadres de, de, de qualification et du, et du statut euh, des enseignants. Et puis il y a une troisième dimension euh, qui touche à, à, à la recherche et à l'identification des, des pratiques pédagogiques qui sont les, les plus prometteuses, les plus porteuses, je dirais, de réussite scolaire. Donc, encore une fois, nous avons, je vous l'indiquais ce matin, actuellement les discussions du Conseil exécutif et bientôt la conférence générale qui va approuver le programme et le budget de l'éducation. Mais je peux déjà vous assurer que le travail sur les enseignants continuera de constituer un axe fort du programme de l'UNESCO en matière d'éducation. Alors je voudrais peut-être commenter quelques-uns des témoignages qui nous ont été apportés tout à l'heure. Bon, tout d'abord remarquer la forte mobilisation telle qu'elle a pu s'illustrer à travers la parole des enseignants des différentes régions du monde cet après-midi. Mais je voudrais en particulier remarquer et saluer encore une fois l'initiative qui a été lancée par l'International de l'éducation pour conduire cette espèce d'évaluation finalement de l'éducation pour tous. Alors on a eu une présentation du cadre un petit peu méthodologique de ce travail, quelques éléments également sur les premiers résultats, mais je crois qu'il faut saluer également ce travail qui va constituer finalement un regard croisé, un regard des enseignants, du monde des enseignants, et qui va compléter de manière très utile l'évaluation et notamment le rapport, les résultats du prochain rapport de l'équipe mondiale pour le suivi de l'éducation pour tous. Je voudrais à ce propos signaler également que le secrétaire de l'UNESCO a lancé également euh, un processus d'évaluation de l'éducation pour tous. J'ai évoqué très rapidement euh, ce matin euh, le processus euh, en vue euh, de l'après euh, 2015 et de, de l'agenda international pour, euh, pour l'éducation. Je voudrais euh, vous informer, pour ceux qui ne sont pas déjà euh, au courant de cette initiative, que l'UNESCO a lancé déjà un processus d'évaluation de l'éducation pour tous au niveau international, euh, processus euh, qui va être réalisé par euh, les États membres. Et nous avons euh, d'une part euh, réalisé un certain nombre de consultations déjà au niveau régional pour euh, présenter et définir euh, cette, euh, cet exercice. Nous avons également invité euh, les États membres à engager euh, les travaux pour conduire cette euh, évaluation de l'éducation pour tous. Et nous avons également produit des cadres méthodologiques qui vont permettre d'accompagner, d'orienter le travail des pays pour cette tâche, mais également permettre d'arriver à des éléments de comparaison au niveau international. Je voudrais dire également que ce, ce travail comporte trois volets. Un volet diagnostique qui va permettre de, de mesurer les progrès réalisés par les États membres par rapport aux six objectifs de l'éducation pour tous, mais un volet également analytique 
sur les politiques euh, publiques. C'est-à-dire qu'il sera, il s'agira de voir quels sont les, les chemins, quels ont été les chemins qui ont été empruntés par les États membres depuis Dakar pour atteindre les objectifs de l'éducation pour tous. Et puis le troisième volet, c'est celui qui, je pense, va nous, nous intéresser d'un point de vue prospectif. Le troisième volet concerne l'après 2015 et la façon dont les États membres eux-mêmes définissent, perçoivent, anticipent les prochains défis pour le développement de l'éducation et je dirais la prochaine étape de l'éducation pour tous au-delà de l'année 2015. L'ensemble de ces, de ces travaux vont, dans une certaine façon, compléter également l'analyse conduite par l'International de l'éducation et seront livrés pour la conférence qui va clôturer le processus de l'éducation pour tous depuis Dakar, conférence qui se tiendra donc en 2015 en Corée. Euh, je voudrais euh, faire un deuxième, euh, peut-être une deuxième remarque sur l'un des, des thèmes qui a été évoqué également euh, tout à l'heure, à savoir euh, la participation des enseignants, non seulement à l'enseignement, mais également aux réflexions sur les politiques publiques et sur les réformes de l'éducation. Euh, on l'a dit, on l'a entendu tout à l'heure, on l'a entendu de la bouche d'éducation internationale, euh, les enseignants doivent être également des acteurs du changement des politiques publiques en éducation, mais il est intéressant que cela ait été euh, rappelé également par notre collègue de, de l'OCDE euh, dans sa présentation. Et c'est là un, un travail euh, dans lequel, sur lequel l'UNESCO euh, va s'engager, et nous, nous venons en fait de définir conjointement avec l'International de l'éducation une nouvelle initiative qui va nous permettre dans une dizaine de pays de définir et d'accompagner les organisations représentantes des enseignants pour leur permettre de participer pleinement au, au dialogue sectoriel à travers les, les groupes sectoriels en éducation qui existent au, au niveau national. Ça, c'est un, un point, je dirais, qui peut être véritablement euh, marqueur d'une nouvelle dynamique euh, au niveau national dans le dialogue en éducation et c'est un, un programme qui est euh, appuyé par, dans le cadre d'une initiative du partenariat mondial pour l'éducation dont nous avons euh, parlé ce matin. Donc je voulais souligner également cette collaboration euh, entre euh, éducation internationale et l'UNESCO pour véritablement euh, relever l'un des défis qui a été identifié comme euh, l'un des défis majeurs également pour faire en sorte que la voix des enseignants soit pleinement prise en compte dans la définition euh, des politiques et, et des réformes en éducation. Voilà ce que je voulais euh, souligner, je dirais, en, en, en écho euh, aux présentations qui ont été faites euh, cet après-midi. Euh, une fois de plus, je voudrais indiquer au nom de l'UNESCO que nous, nous, nous saluons et nous félicitons l'international de l'éducation et je dirais l'ensemble de, de, de ses membres au travers de ses représentations dans les différentes régions du monde pour, cette, pour avoir pris l'initiative de lancer ce, ce travail. Et encore une fois, c'est un travail qui va venir amplifier toute la dynamique, non seulement de l'éducation pour tous en vue de l'échéance de 2015, mais également la réflexion sur l'après 2015. Et je pense que nous nous retrouverons euh, avec euh, plaisir et une certaine impatience euh, dans, dans un an, en octobre euh, 2014, euh, de Fred, pour faire un, un bilan finalement de cette, de cette campagne, euh, tirer les leçons et voir comment nous pouvons euh, rebondir euh, sur euh, finalement ces, ces fruits pour engager une nouvelle dynamique au-delà euh, de 2015. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Thank you, UNESCO, for hosting us uh, here today. I want to uh, thank everyone who has spent their day here. It has been a long day. It has been a bit of a marathon. But let's hope now we are prepared, whether we are going home to Brussels to run the Brussels Marathon, whether we are going to the horse races in Paris, or whether you are just ready to go home and relax. But you can, may not relax for very long, because remember, this was a launch. Now starts the year of action, and it is your responsibility to go home and act. 
so that we can fill up the map on our website, which we have launched today, with activities going on, so that you engage with your comments, send us your material, make us visual around the world, so that when we meet again in a year, we know that we've made a difference. We know that we have united for better education, for a better world, and that we have achieved quality education for more children and can see the end that we get it all. And I have to thank the interpreters. Without them, communication wouldn't be possible. They are symbols of what education can do. Thank you so much. We need you. And I got a very important piece of paper before I let you out of the room. There's a cocktail bar on the seventh floor now. So have a safe trip home or up to the seventh floor, and we hope to meet you all again next year. Thank you.